So, um, hello, I'm Simon Bath, astronomers. Before we go any further, um, if you do feel a little bit faint or whatever, please feel free to step out. I won't take any offence um, until we get a little bit of air. Okay, yeah, so this is September. So um, in astronomy things, it's just like a school year. We actually kick off in September. We run all the way through to June. So we uh, haven't actually had any talks in July or in August. Okay, so uh, this is us. Darkness returns. So um, just wait another month and we'll actually have the clocks go back. Um, this is our illustrious team here. Um, you'll see some of them um, uh, in the room here. So we've got Jay, we've got Merrick, we've got Prim and myself. Uh, Mike's hiding probably somewhere nice and hot, and Jonathan's um, in Kensham, but uh, he's online now. Um, we've got a bit mad with social media. Um, I'm not sure if anyone's got that many social media accounts, but we've got six current social media accounts that uh, we could uh, use. And if you ever want to have a phone that beeps all the time during the day, <laughs> join one of our WhatsApp groups. Um, observing is the one where I have to put, oh, when I go to work, I have to put my phone on silent, and it's because of the observing group. Um, but it's because there's really good stuff that's going on there. So we've also got Rob, uh, who's joined us this evening. Uh, he posts lots of stuff, Roger as well. And I also po post some really rubbish stuff as well, in contrast to the really good stuff that they post. Um, and there's things uh, like the trips that we recently had, uh, which can go onto the social one as well. And I'm not sure how active, because I'm not allowed to be on the uh, US Eclipse one, um, but maybe that will build up in energy uh, as we get towards April 2024. Um, we meet up every Wednesday, um, and currently, well, we did have 108 members, but uh, thank you for joining last night. Uh, you make us 109. Um, so, uh, yeah, we do the, the monthly meetups, but we try and meet up um, sort of at least once uh, a month on other activities, whether they be social or mostly observing. Um, so there's lots of opportunities to get out there and see the night sky. It's a new battery going. Um, we've got here's our program of upcoming talks. Um, Steve Warbis, uh, he's from Macclesfield Astronomical Society. He runs all their trips. Um, I think he was chair once, um, but he did, um, just before lockdown, he started doing a, a, like uh, talks for other societies. And one of them was on um, astrophotography, a quick guide to astrophotography. And it launched many, many astrophotographers during lockdown. And there's a lot of amazing photos out there because of Steve's talks that he did to all these astro societies and got people buying stuff from First Light Optics and coming up with some amazing images. So Steve's coming to give his intro. Um, uh, what, I think it's quick astrophotography uh, in light polluted skies. So it's kind of ideal for bar. So hopefully that'll inspire a few. Um, Hopefully, I've got my fingers crossed, uh, Dr. Becky Smithers is going to join us, um, not here, but in Brilsey on Tuesday, the 28th of November. Um, and uh, she'll be talking about her pet subject, which is black holes and um, how they uh, sort of uh, throttle galaxy um, formation. Um, we're still trying to get hold of her. She's a very busy lady, but um, she's promised that she'll be able to make the 28th. So, Fingers crossed that will all come there. Um, because of the venue, et cetera, you do need to reserve a space. So um, in all the links I send out, the things like this, uh, there's a QR code, and that will take you to Eventbrite. We have a little code that is still free. So we try and make all our talks for the Bath Astronomers free. But if you don't have that code, then it will cost you £10 to enter. Um, and that's mostly because we have to pay for the Brilsey building. Uh, for the evening, and that's that's why we've got the cost in there. Uh, we've got Richard Hook, who worked for the European Southern Observatory, and he's basically talking about the um, ELT, um, the uh, extremely large telescope, inventive astronomers as ever, how to name a telescope. Um, and so he'll be taking through um, how the, the development of the ELT and where it's got to and where it's going to go and what's it going to do. So if you've ever wondered about the ELT, um, and it's coming on quite nicely, a lot of, most of the uh, heavy structure is up already. And so I think it's still a couple of years before they've got optics in there and they'll be testing them. So it's still a couple of years maybe before first light. Uh, Dr. Carol Guildforth is coming to talk to us. My, she's also on galaxies. So I've got a, there's going to be an interesting uh, balance, not ba uh, galaxies, she's also on black holes, so there'll be a balance between Carolyn and Becky. Uh, so once Becky has sort of uh, sorted her topic, I'm going to make sure Carolyn doesn't, um, 
we basically get the two talk company to each other rather than going and saying includes some Gary Barlow stuff in her call. You never know. You never know. Um, I think about it, but we've got members night in February. That's where people can stand up for a 5, 10, 15 minute sort of chat about what they like in astronomy, perhaps their project work, perhaps Rob and Roger will displace the fineries of the um, night sky that they've been recording. Perhaps someone's repaired a telescope. Perhaps you just enjoy sitting out and sort of what you think about um, when you're doing stuff. Um, Whatever goes is for members' night. So I'll be looking for uh, volunteers uh, after the new year. Um, Dr. Emma Curtis Lake, she, um, uh, her studies involve JWST and pr um, uh, promoting the James Webb Space Telescope and outreach. And so she, she actually came to talk to us about, uh, gosh, January, about a month after the JWST launch. So she, she told us how it was, it was doing okay in all its prep tests. So coming back over uh, just over a year after that, so um, go through the first year of operation and um, everything that's gone on and all the exciting stuff to go forward. Um, Professor Lee Fletcher, um, fingers crossed he's going to be able to travel to us. Um, he is a gas giant specialist, so he'll be talking about the solar system and he'll talk about some of the space probes he's been involved in in going out there. Uh, Penny is very much like Dr. Jenny. She loves space dust. So there'll be lots more going on about space dust. And you may remember Pete Richardson came to us uh, over a year ago with his home-built telescope. He built a 12-inch telescope. It was a 10-inch telescope. It was a 10-inch telescope. Um, out of wood, perfectly fettled. He ground the mirror himself. He built a machine to grind the mirrors and polish the mirrors. Um, the reason why he was making a 10-inch is because he thought he could then upscale it to 20 inches, which is a pretty huge telescope. Yeah. And he's most of the way through the build. Um, he thinks he's finally finished figuring the 20 inch and he's on the construction. So he's got uh, just under a year to finish the beast and then he can come and talk to us uh, about it. <laughs> um, apparently the 10 inch, because when we saw it, it was just glass. He hadn't had the mirror silvered. It's a, it's a really amazing um, uh, device, mainly because he's doing all the optical testing. So if it's not perfect, he's, he goes back and regrinds it and regrinds it and regrinds it. Um, I think the 20 inch has been ground three times already because um, it's quite a knack to be able to actually get these big mirrors and sort of, he, he knows William Herschel's pain from all that time ago. So uh, that's our, our amateur, um, who should be able to give us an update. Um, but what else has been going on? Well, uh, I know what I did last summer. Uh, so a uh, sort of an update on uh, what have you missed since we last met in July? Probably just change the batteries on this, let's just see. Right, so we've done lots of shows. Um, so we've got Roger here um, doing his rocket launching. Um, so we had a new rocket launcher. Um, the last one had lasted about three or four years. Um, and it was beginning to have a bit of wear and tear. So uh, this summer we've been out. I think this, where was this? This was Bath Hampton. And uh, this was, gosh, um, I'm trying to remember where that was. Uh, Hinton Charter House, that was. And then this is up and odd down. And so we've basically just been going to fates and taking all the telescopes, send the telescopes here, um, dressing up, rocket launching, whatever you can. We just take it just to get people interested in a bit of science going on. Um, we've had uh, Charles at the top of the um, Abbey Tower mm -hmm. doing solar observing up there. And uh, there was a dark sky festival at uh, Marlborough about two years ago, and uh, they didn't have funding this year to run anything. So we offered to go and take uh, our uh, mobile planetarium to their town hall. And um, for the day, we just ran shows for anyone that uh, was there. So we had a mini dark sky festival sort of on the cheap at Marlborough, and uh, that went down really well. Uh, so it's a, a few hundred people visiting that. Uh, we also camped out on uh, York Street, doing solar observing and giving out balloons. Um, I was dressed as a stormtrooper, uh, trying to scare as many children as possible. Um, I think I, I succeeded quite well there. And uh, there's lots of sort of uh, people getting together to help out. So we have more volunteers. So we've uh, uh, got um, uh, Martin and Roger here um, manning the stool. So, there's nothing wrong with volunteering and it can be quite fun. Um, uh, it can be busy, but it can also be very rewarding and fun. 
And we've also managed to get a little bit of observing in here at, Mon um, at Moncton Coombe in the observatory. And again, we've been running night, the first of the nighttime events back up at the top of the Abbey. Um, and that's alongside Gaia. Have you managed to visit Gaia yet in the Abbey? Not yet. So yeah, and we're there on Fridays. Uh, we've got Master of Ceremonies Merrick here, who's guiding people um, on going into um, the uh, planetarium. And then I was doing a talk underneath here, or sort of like a have you ever thought rather than sort of a formal talk and sort of getting people in conversation about um, the uh, the earth there. Uh, it's amazing how many people walk up to it and they just go, oh yes, the earth and walk away. Um, <laughs> we, knew, we knew they did this from the moon and when, we, when the moon was um, in the Abbey uh, a year or so ago, uh, we had teams trained up to go and do those kind of engagement things. So we're doing the same on um, Gaia, but it's, it's a little tougher on Gaia because everyone kind of knows uh, what's going on. And uh, we've also got, uh, we've also just been to the Bucket Observatory, um, which was in Marlborough. So thank you very much for organising that. Um, it was a great one. Yeah, a little round of applause. For it. Okay. I actually even managed to organise on the cloudiest night where everyone thought there's not a chance. We actually got to see, um, and this is a 10 inch Cook refractor. And we actually got to see through it. And um, it's not just, the looking through it is amazing. It's the way that they've restored it. And it's a, a telescope from 1860, which they've changed it, put lots of electronics on the side and things, but all in beautiful brass and things like that and cased away. And it's a go-to telescope. It's an 1860 go-to. Um, so you just dial in on that little pad they've got in the middle there, gray pad, and it'll go to anywhere you want in the sky. Um, I've got telescope NB and sort of like, yeah, uh, we've only got a seven inch and uh, it is not go to. Um, so we'll just have to see what we can do um, to make that a little bit better. Uh, so, what our next talk, as a talk, that's Steve Warbus. Uh, so, there's Steve. Uh, I know him from uh, a, a program, a, a radio program called Reach Out and Touch Space, which was on over um, the lockdown period. And it was like amateur astronomers all over the UK just having a chat on Zoom, but also broadcast around the world on radio as well. Steve was one of the panellists, I was one of the panellists, and we sort of kept in touch um, as we've gone along. So um, I asked him if he'd mind giving his talk, and he said yes, which is absolutely great. And we've also, uh, next, before Steve goes on, um, which is a reminder, we've got our AGM. And AGMs are usually boring things, so we're trying to make them as quickly as possible. We are changing a few things. So um, the things we're changing, uh, we'd like to put in an honorary membership. Um, there'll be more detail on the AGM, but um, we're, we're, in, we're naming a few things, changing stuff around, um, putting a little bit of modernization talk in there in terms of uh, uh, duties and protections as well. And currently we're sort of going against the constitution, the way that we've allowed access to the bank account. Uh, there's currently three people who can access, and this definitely says only one person can have access. So we've got to change that because we've, we've given three for a reason, and it's a very good reason, but it's against the constitution. So we need to reflect how we're working. Um, so constitutions need to be evolving documents as well. Um, and we also want to eject, eject, elect, let's eject and then elect uh, the new coordination team. Um, and these, so typically uh, we've got three roles. We've got uh, chair, uh, we've got secretary, we've got treasurer, and then everyone else is one of these ordinary officers. But there are other things that go on um, and they're usually picked up either by myself or the ordinary officers. Um, the one thing that we do have to have definitely is someone designated child protection responsible officer. We actually have to do that for insurance purposes. And in most cases, that's me. And the policies say if, if no one else is named, it will be the chair is the, char uh, the child protection responsible officer. So um, if, if that's your thing then you can go for that. So all of those are up for there, but we, we don't necessarily need to fill, but we will be looking to fill the chair, the secretary, the treasurer, and get as many people who are keen to um, sort of get involved as possible. So um, we can, congratulations, Prim, she's an ordinary officer. Um, Merrick, all the hard work that he does with the planetarium, he's an ordinary officer as well. So uh, he gets to have um, sort of 
strong perks of being in coordination team. <laughs> there must be some. I haven't worked out what they are, but there must be some. Oh, okay. Easy. Yeah. All right, well, let's get on to um, the main piece of the talk, um, which is um, Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. Um, and hopefully, you know, this is our James Webb Space Telescope, and there's quite a few stars here. And this is Carina Nebula, and this is where stars are being born. Um, and it's a lot more detailed than the original uh, Hubble telescope. Um, I was asked to do this talk by, it's actually Prim again, um, because we, we think about stars, but what do we actually know about them? Especially in sort of, they're sort of like just bright spot, uh, spots in the sky, maybe you see a few doubles. So this is hopefully just put a little bit of flesh about the life of the star, what it goes through. And so when someone talks about a particular star and the type of it, you might be able to go, oh yeah, I remember, because it was like that picture and that picture, and sort of trying to bring. So that's all I'm after tonight. Some pretty pictures, so that you can remember them when we're talking about um, particular stars, when we're actually doing observing, okay, rather than them just being strange points of light out there. All right, well, there's a lot out there. So there's another uh, Hubble picture. So um, if we uh, count all the stars in our galaxy, well, we've got about 200 billion, and there's maybe over 100 billion, 200 billion, maybe even more um, galaxies within our observable universe. You add those together, we've got a few stars. Uh, so that's 10 to the 22 is the minimum count for the number of stars. Um, so that's a billion trillion, 10 billion trillion. Um, it's going to take quite a while to study each one of these. Um, and even if we wait for the 100 billion in our own uh, neck of the woods, it's going to take a long while. So we've got to sort of attack this in a logical manner and try and work out. And just imagine going back in time, 100 years ago, stars were still points of light, stars that we didn't actually have any knowledge. So how are we going to start trying to work out what these 100 billion trillion stars are? Um, so well, one of the best ways is perhaps let's try and work out what they're made of, because 100 years ago, we didn't know. Okay, so uh, let's bring in our first actress into the... Wait, wait, wait. It does work eventually if I get close enough. So this is the person that found out what all of those 100 billion, or sorry, 10 billion trillion stars are actually made of. This is, uh, at this point, this is uh, Miss Cecilia Payne, and uh, an English lady. She's um, around the age of 19, 20, and she's going to uh, Newnham College in uh, Cambridge, University of Cambridge. And she's studying botany. So things aren't looking good to start off with. It's the first year of her botany degree at Newnham. And um, she's a bit bored. And one night, one of her friends um, wants to go out with a chap, but she already had tickets to a lecture, a science lecture. So she said to C uh, Cecilia, would you like my ticket? Because I'm going out with my young beau. Mm -hmm. And Cecilia, bored with what she was doing, decided to go. It's the lecture that changed her life. It was by Sir um, Arthur Eddington, and it was on his expedition um, to try and prove that uh, Einstein's theory of relativity was um, correct or better, more accurate than Newton's theory. Uh, and he went to an eclipse and he was measuring the position of stars because uh, during an eclipse, you can see the stars behind. And in theory, the starlight is bent by the mass of the object. Newton's rule said actually it will bend a certain amount, and Einstein's rule said it will bend a different amount. So you measure whichever one is closer is probably the better theory. And it turned out he proved that Einstein's was the better theory. So she went absolutely mad. She, um, her friends said that she was actually dictating or replaying the, the talk to them over sub, um, subsequent days. If you ever remember a lecture that you enjoyed so much, that you just keep talking about it and repeating bits and things that were said. Well, that's what happened to her. And she tried to change course and she, they wouldn't let her to start off with. And she had to persuade them um, to uh, allow her to change course into physics and into astronomy. So she couldn't do it immediately. She had to wait for the year to close, but she actually got transferred and she became um, physics and astronomy. And she opened up the uh, telescope uh, on the college, and she started running that uh, sort of like as her pet thing. Uh, she got, uh, she finished uh, the degree course, and um, as with Newnham College and all of Cambridge College at that time, as a woman, you couldn't be awarded the degree. 
um, and she was advised by people, and she kept touch with Sir Arthur Eddington, um, as well as other people, they all said, you don't stand a chance in the UK. So there she had what looked good on paper, but actually wasn't a degree. She couldn't say she had a degree from Cambridge. Um, so she went to America based on the advice that she was given, and she went to um, Harvard uh, University and Harvard Observatory, which is where all the computers, you might know all the women that were um, employed to support the, the observatory there, um, that's where they all were based. And she went and she got independent funds to study a PhD there. Um, and uh, because she had, uh, she was independently funded, the director of the um, observatory could only assist her in what she was doing. Basically, she could say what she was going to do because she was self-funded. And she looked at the tens of thousands of slides they had with um, breakdowns of the, of the color of the stars, and it, you get a, it's called a spectra, where you, all the blue light is spit out, the green light, the yellow light, the orange light, and the red light, and you get a distinct pattern per star. And there were tens of thousands of these slides, and it was a great opportunity to try and use these slides to work out what these stars were made of. So she set her PhD mission up to do that, and in 1925, she finished her PhD thesis. Um, it went out to review, and uh, one of those reviewers was a chap called um, Henry Norris Russell. Um, his name will come back um, a little bit uh, later in that. And he said that was kind of poppycock, because when you look at this spectra, and this is the spectra of the sun, you see all the elements that are things like potassium, sodium. It's all the stuff that the Earth's made of. OK, so the prevailing theory is somehow the, uh, the sun is made of the, the same stuff as the Earth, but something's making it really, really hot. OK, but it's made of. But her thesis said the sun is made of hydrogen and a little bit of helium and then trace elements after that. Um, so he asked her to change her uh, findings, which she did. But she did it by just saying that my finding that it's made of helium, uh, uh, hydrogen is a spurious result. So that was the result she came out with. Um, but uh, the original thesis um, before she did the slight amendment to change it from a, a definitive everything's made of hydrogen to a spurious result, it seems. It was known about, and her thesis was described as the, um, the, by Otto Struve, who was an amazing astronomer, end of the 20s uh, going forward. Um, he described it as the best um, thesis that has been done in astronomy. So there have been four, uh, uh, 300 years of theses, and he was sort of saying it was better than all of those astronomers who'd written up before. So that's pretty good um, praise. Um, so where do we go from there? Well, we now know what it's made of, but we're sort of, how does it all come together? You can't just have sort of globs of hydrogen and uh, nothing sort of stored. So, We've got uh, our interstellar medium here, and we've got densities, uh, over densities, and we've got a molecular cloud. And that's what this wispy smoke is. This is uh, a giant molecular cloud. And we're talking thousands of light, well, actually tens to hundreds of light years going across. And we've got our time playing forward here, and we can actually see it's actually coming together. And the disturbances are potentially supernova explosions causing ripples in the gas. Um, it could be that there's two masses of globular uh, molecular clouds, or so giant molecular clouds, and they just happen to pass each other. And it's the interaction where you get this crease, and that's where stuff starts to form. And we start getting overdensities um, in these particular areas. But the vast majority of this. Um, well, that's a vast majority. About 80% of this is hydrogen gas. Most of the rest is helium gas. There's about 1% of sort of uh, dust from earlier population stars in here. And then right in those little spots, you start getting more gravitational effects. And as it collapses down from a ball, it flattens out. And then you've got conservation of angular momentum. It starts to spin up. And material starts gathering into the middle. And you start getting a protostar or something close and akin um, to a protostar as it's called as everything swirls around but there's still lots of dust associated with it but effectively the giant molecular cloud has now compressed 
And did you notice in the original diagram before, there were lots of little spots starting out? So this won't be by itself, and this is why you have binary stars and multiple star systems, because they were all affected by that original contraction, whatever the original cause was. So in the smallest scale, if you've got stuff that's up to about 13 times Jupiter's mass, it's going to be a planet. Okay, and it's just going to sit there and do nothing for the next trillion years. Okay, there's small heat sources, a little bit of radiation, uh, a little bit of um, uh, fission processes, so bigger uh, um, uh, elements breaking down into smaller elements, giving out heat. So there's a little bit of heat inside these things, but they're slowly cooling down. And we've got our brown dwarfs as well. These aren't big enough to kick off. Um, there's a little bit of deuterium fusion going in, which gives them a little bit of warmth, but these will be just residing, minding their own business. Um, they're not too much bigger than um, uh, Jupiter. And so we're talking about 8%, the maximum of 8% of the sun's mass to create these brown dwarfs. And they're just collections of hydrogen. This is all. So Jupiter's mostly hydrogen, Saturn's mostly hydrogen, and these are mostly hydrogen. They're just big balls of hydrogen, not doing much. They're technically not stars. Less than uh, 80 Jupiter masses, that's 8% of the sun, then we haven't actually got a star yet. Those proto-stars haven't really worked. So what, what is it that's going to make us a star? Any questions, any sort of, any, any ideas what's going to make us a star? What do we need to do to make this a star? What needs to be different to make that a star? Fusion is a star. Fusion. And that's the idea. Do you remember that Arthur Eddington guy? That's him. The one that kicked off um, the uh, fascination of Cecilia. Well, that's him. The year after she published her paper that most things are made of hydrogen, he published a paper to suggest that actually the heat source behind stars must be hydrogen based then. And there must be something happening at a subatomic level with hydrogen. The problem is you can work out, they have the mass then to work out, well, if I took a huge amount of um, uh, hydrogen gas, they, they, their mass would work all the way to the center. And the quantum models they had said that actually the repulsive forces there are too high. So, he didn't know, they didn't know in 1926 how this worked because everything they had in quantum mechanics at that point said, you haven't got enough energy in there to force these things together. The, the, the repulsion forces are too great. It wasn't until 1939, so 13 years after his idea that it must be hydrogen, um, that the PP chain, the proton-proton chain was suggested and the reason why this suddenly became realistic is because someone worked out that in quantum um, uh, mechanics, you don't actually need to force things together. You don't actually need to defeat the energy because there's things called tunneling or thing, a, a process called tunneling occurs where you've got something that's trying to get close. It's being forced away. But in the quantum world, it's just a sort of it and it goes through anyway. OK, and that's enough. So they worked out that tunneling was enough to allow this to occur but you need to get to 10 million degrees in the center of the sun. But their maths had already said that compressive force would be at 10 million degrees. Okay, so they've got a, a process that works and they came up with another one. Well, actually, if you raise the temperature to about 17 million degrees, we've got another process that works. And this is the carbon nitrogen oxygen cycle. This is another way that hydrogen can actually come together and um, make bigger and bigger um, elements out of it, fusing them together, the fusion process. So this is the one that our sun really uses, but if you get hotter and bigger, then we start going over to the CNO cycle as we get hotter and in there. And where's all this energy coming from? Well, the stuff that you see, the light that you see is these little Y shapes, these gammas that are coming out of these reactions. Those gammas, that's gamma radiations given right at the center, right? But it then has to play ping pong all the way through the, the um, layers of the sun to get out. And it's losing energy. It's exchanging energy each time. And when uh, a photon loses energy, its wavelength increases and it moves from being gamma to X-ray 
ultraviolet to visible. So it's just losing energy all the time. By the time it gets to the surface of our sun, bang, we've got the whole spectrum that's available. But it actually started right in the middle of the sun in its sort of 100,000 100, year journey from the center all the way through um, to the outside. Um, it started off as a gamma. So that's this is the light that we see every day in our lives. It's that gamma that's coming from that reaction there. Now, how did they actually know this was true then? Well, it should give out something called a neutrino when um, this reaction occurs. And guess what happens? As soon as they did, uh, came up with the neutrino detector in the 60s, I think it was the 60s, um, then from the sun, we were being blasted by neutrinos, which backed up this whole theory um, that it was this PP chain that was actually um, uh, providing energy and, uh, and sort of powering all our suns. So his idea in 1926 and 1939, we actually had a real mechanism. So it, it, this is fusion. This is the way that fusion works for us. And uh, this is the way we can sort of power those stars as they go through. So our protostar, so it, it just condenses, it just uh, gravitationally, it's just pulled in, pulls it until it gets hotter and hotter and hotter. And at some point, fusion starts commencing right in the middle uh, when it gets to 100 million degrees. And when it starts to get to 100 million degrees, it starts pushing out. So that's the point that we get to um, fusion. But when we look at the night sky, we've got blue stars, we've got yellow stars, we've got red stars. How does that work? So we now know what they're made of. We now know how they're powered, but why, why are we pretty colours? Um, so that's the next thing we need to um, study because we, we've moved from protostars forward. Well, the possible mechanisms we've got to look for, um, we can look at their brightness of stars and we can look at their colour to try and work out sort of why that we've got all these different flavours of stars. And so our next actor in here um, is uh, Henrietta Swan Levitt. And uh, she was one of the computers at Harvard again. Now, she predates by about 30 years, uh, uh, 20 years, 25 years, she predates uh, Cecilia moving to Harvard. So she's one of the people that sort of laid the ground and did all the hard work that Cecilia picked up and started piecing together all the parts of the puzzle to come up with the theory of what the stars are made of. What she did was she was tasked to look at um, sepia variable stars that were flashing or pulsing at a very regular period and work out why some flashed fast, some flashed slow. Um, and she did the uh, work on studying the photos that uh, the astronomers had taken at night. And she got um, sort of um, the, she mapped on a diagram, the period, the log of the period, versus the brightness that she saw. And she did this for the a Large Magellanic Cloud. So most of these stars were very close together, okay? Um, and they also used uh, parallax to work out the distance to stars. So they sort of got a baseline. And when she plotted it, there seems to be this line. So each one of these, there's about 25 stars that she used in the first sample. Can you see that this is when they're brightest? That's the line, this is when they're dimmest. 25 stars, there seem to be a pattern. All these 25 stars seem to be following a pattern. Some are brighter than others, others are flashing faster. But what she worked out is it became known, uh, became known as the Levitt law um, that you could use these seafood variables to work out distance to things because we could measure how bright they appear to us. But um, um, depending on how fast they flash, Actually, if I got close to them, I'd know what their luminosity was. So if they um, had a higher rate of flash, they'd have a different luminosity. Um, so you can actually work out how far things are away, just from the brightness they see now and counting the flashes, just by using her straight line graph. And um, it's one of the things that Hubble used um, to work out how far uh, things like Andromeda uh, were away. But OK, we, we've kind of worked out sort of um, distances and things. Um, but we still don't know anything about colour. Um, so uh, welcome in um, Wilhelmina Fleming. And uh, she started studying all of the pictures that Edward Pickering, he was the director of the Harvard Observatory. She started examining, she was the lead on examining um, all of those spectra to try and work out, okay, you've got a blue one, a red one, a reddish orange one. Can we, can we put some order to it? 
And she looked at all those lines in those spectra, um, which are absorption lines, and she started arranging them by hydrogen lines, certain lines in those. And she came up with the Draper catalog. And she is the woman that gave us A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q of stars. Right? And if, if you don't know stars, it probably doesn't mean anything to you. But if you do know a little bit about stars and some funny letters, you go, why do they have the funny letters? She came up with the funny letters. She categorized stars by the, the, the color, the spectra, the, the rainbows that were split um, uh, when you split the star, uh, the light from an individual star. So she did a good job with Draper, but we've got um, and, uh, Annie Jump Cannon here, who uh, followed on from Wilhelmina. She looked at Wilhelmina's work and said, gosh, what's that, 17 categories of star? That's too many. There's too much complexity in this. Mm -hmm. And in discussions, there was sort of, well, we've used lines and spectra in here, but physics has moved on, and we knew that the colour of a star represented its temperature, the surface temperature of a star. So what um, Ali did is she took Wilhelmina's work and her categorizations, and she simplified them down. She went from 17 down to 7. Okay, so um, her work and sort of, sort of working out, well, why... Why have you got three? And I'm going to group them together and coming up with a, a logical way of doing that and a scientific way of doing that, but mostly based on the temperature of the star. OK, so she really simplified it down. And that gave us. So these are spectra for individual stars. So this is Annie's system where you've got a letter. O, B, A, F, G, K, M. And you've got, well, some are going to be a slightly brighter uh, in certain areas and others. So um, you've got a one and that's, it goes up from zero up to nine. So you can have A0 to A9. And this is Annie's system. And it simplified it quite a lot from 17 categories to seven simple categories. And then they're just a, effectively it's a brightness measure, like a volume control on each of those stars. Um, so that's really cool what she did. And you can measure now, uh, you can actually sorry, you can uh, record stars by their temperature. So the hottest stars are O, you then get cooler to B, to A, to F, to G, to K, and then down to red dwarfs, um, which are M. Okay, so the hottest O all the way through. Now, anyone remember any ways to sort of remember? That particular one, well, one of the ones when I was growing up, um, so it was this, oh, be a fine girl, kiss me, but things have really moved on now, and <laughs> it's not really a way that we should be remembering stuff, it's, uh, that's a past age. So here's my preferred way of remembering it, old bath astronomers find go-to kit maddening. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so that's from the brightest stars all the way through. So, our star is a G2, okay? So it's not that bright in the scale of things. 75% um, of the stars um, in the night sky are in the red dwarf category. They're Ks and the Ms. Um, and we're in the sort of the 12, uh, actually about 7 or 8% category in the Gs. Okay? So we can be our old, maddened uh, Bath astronomer. He hasn't accepted, but this is why we're having the honorary thing. Well, let's see if we can invite Charles to be a member. You never know. <laughs> So the king, so I mustn't be. Uh, um, but we need to move on a little bit. So we're going to introduce um, this chap here. This is Hertzsprung, Enya Hertzsprung. Um, and uh, so we've got a classification. We know how far stars are. We know how uh, a good way of working out how bright they are. It's not. It's no good just working out how bright they are as I see them. I actually have to work out how really bright they are if I go to a standard distance from a star. Um, so um, we've got that um, system, so we can do that. And um, in this case, we've got color here and brightness along. And this is the Pleiades and the Hyades. So what he's done is he's measured the, um, the absolute luminosity of each of these stars um, using uh, the Seafield rule and knowing how far the, piece, uh, the, uh, the Pleiades are um, uh, far. And uh, he's also got the temperature of the stars effectively up here. And Hertzsprung saw a line. Can you see a line? 
it's not the greatest of lines. He's only got, because if you actually look at the Pleiades and the Hyades, there's actually not that many stars for him to have used. Um, but he did this in 1911. He saw this relationship in 1911. Now, that evil gentleman that made Cecilia change her PhD thesis, this is the chap. Mm -hmm. This is Edward Pickering, Edward Charles Pickering. Um, he did it in a big way, but he had access to Harvard Observatories catalogs, and he had access to the computing resource, effectively, of the ladies that um, we've got, Wilhelmina, um, with, uh, Annie Jump Cannon as well. So he did the same thing. He tended to use um, sort of uh, clusters um, again, but he came up with the same relationship. That if you plot, in this case, the color of the star, and could you see the colors at the top? He's written the colors there. So he's got the same classification uh, system. He hasn't got any O's, but uh, he's got an extra N at the end. <laughs> um, but, and this is the, uh, the luminosity. When you do that, he's got a line there. There's something weird about stars. So depending on how, a certain temperature can be only, only a certain luminosity, and this relationship seems to go through. So this seems to be driving stars. And there's something common in stars, and it's, of course, that fusion that we got. Now, if we do the same thing with Gaia, so this is 58,000 stars from the Gaia um, uh, analysis of the night sky. So the space probe went up and worked out the position and the color of 58,000, actually did mid billions of stars. So we spun them around and we're ordering them by uh, temperature across. And now I'm gonna move them and rearrange them by luminosity. And then finally, I'm gonna, some of the, uh, that's luminosity from what I see, but I'm gonna uh, correct it for the distance as well. So this is the final correction for distance. And we've come up with exactly the same diagram that um, uh, Russell came up with and Hertzsprung came up with. So that's why we've got the um, Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, the HR diagram, that is the story of stars. And this big line here, these are stars that are fusing hydrogen. This is where hydrogen um, is used as the fuel for all stars. If you're not on this line, you started using something else to fuel, uh, to fuel your star, or you've run out of hydrogen, you've run out of everything else. You're effectively this star. But this is the pattern all the way through from our red stars, our smallest stars, to our biggest stars. They all lie on this pattern. It's a wonderful pattern in physics. Um, and it's backed up by um, the Gaia space probe. So yeah. let's, let's write it out nice and quickly. So this is it, and it's called the main sequence. So all stars, whatever star, pretty much um, uh, any star that you see that's in the middle of its life will be on here. When you get old, you move off it. And when you die, you move off it as well. Okay. Um, but during the active part of your life, um, then uh, you'll be on the main sequence. And if you're down this end, then you're going to be around for a long time because you're slowly burning that hydrogen. If you're at this end, you're really, really bright and you're burning your hydrogen really fast and you're going to have short, bright, starlit lives and then, oops, you're in trouble. Um, so we've got that. That's our hudsprung russell diagram, sort of the core to learn to astronomy. So what's actually happened? Our protostar has actually fused and it's coming in but it starts generating um, uh, energy with hydrogen being converted into helium in the center of the core, but it doesn't effectively suddenly just become a star. It's not suddenly on the main, uh, main sequence. It's effectively um, still sort of, um, sort of getting its act together. Um, it's called hydrostatic equilibrium. And it's essentially, there's all this gravitational force and you've just started pushing back but there's still the gravitational force coming in, okay? So if I draw where we are on the diagram, actually the star, our sun didn't suddenly appear. It didn't suddenly pop out the protostar and then I'm on the main sequence, actually started off up here. A big puffy ball, just like a red giant, but it, it's not actually fusing anything. Gravitationally, it starts coming in and it starts, um, uh, fusing hydrogen in, 
And then we get a, a force back, it starts repelling, and it starts stabilizing. Instead of compressing all the time, it stabilizes. And eventually, it stabilizes, you get equilibrium, and that's when it's zero. That's its sort of first birthday as far as a star. Up until then, it's effectively um, pre-main sequence. It's still a protostar, a protostar becoming a star. So that's how they get onto the main sequence. They don't just suddenly burst and say, I'm, I'm ready to go. There's just a ball of gas, and it slowly uh, condenses down, uh, gravitation comes down. Boof, you get that uh, fusion uh, starting. It levels itself out, you get a little bit of a kick, and then you're onto the main sequence. And we've been there for four and a half billion years. It probably took uh, um, about 10 to 50 million years for us to move down from a big puffy ball of gas to actually hit and get onto the main sequence. And most stars that we see in the night sky, or a great deal of the stars we see in the night sky, are on that main sequence. And uh, they've reached hydros uh, hydrostatic equilibrium. So what do some of these stars look like? The really low temperature ones, these, these are red dwarfs. We've got an M type there. M8, quite, quite bright, and compared in size to the sun. And it's only around about 2,000, anywhere to 3,000 uh, degrees Kelvin on the surface, you know, the orange red. We, you can see how long it's going to last. It's 10 billion years, or 100 billion years, that's going to last. Um, uh, so that's a nice long time, um, but it's quite small. About 80% uh, of the size, uh, mass of the sun, all the way through to about 45%. So that's our M type. And then we've got Ks, which are also red dwarfs, but they're bigger. And they go up to about 80% of the size of um, our sun. The um, radii is getting closer towards the sun. Mm -hmm. And we can see that we've got 12% on K type. If I go back, we'll go back. We've got 76, so 88% of those stars are red dwarfs uh, on these numbers. So these last a little uh, shorter lives, down to 50 um, uh, billion years. And then we get to G-type, this is our sun. There's a G-type star, and it's got surface temperatures um, in similar range to where we see. We've got a good lifespan there of 10 billion years, which is what we've got for us. So we go to hotter stars. So sun, so any of these you recognize, we've got seven years of the majority, you might not see that, but um, Procyon, although it's not actually on the main sequence, that particular one, um, but it is um, an F-type star. Moving through, A-type, so we're getting hotter still. So we've got Sirius A, Bommelholtz, and Fecta, which, uh, so Fecta's um, one of the stars in the plough. And B-type's getting even hotter, but bigger. So our sun is um, starting to get dwarfed by some of these B-type stars. And they're up to about 16 uh, solar masses. So it's still not huge, but lovely blue color. Um, but we don't get many of those. And surface temperature can be up to about 30,000. And then finally, O-type stars, about 10 times. Now, when you talk about size of the sun, uh, size of the stars and things, people talk about it's huge. None of those. The biggest main sequence star you're going to find um, is potentially 10 times. Um, which it's a bit odd, isn't it? Have you heard of these really big stars? Yeah. No, oh, there's a mention. That's because those stars have left the main sequence. They've stopped only um, sort of creating hydrogen, uh, helium from the hydrogen in the middle. So strange things can happen, but only once you leave the main sequence. So how are we going to leave the main sequence? Well, we're going to come off and um, we're going to stop um, as soon as... What's the trigger to come off here is we're going to stop fusing hydrogen and we're going to start fusing helium coming off here, but it's going to take a little while to do that. So effectively, the helium in the middle is going to run, the hydrogen in the middle is going to run out. And so we're going to start burning hydrogen a little bit further out, little shells around an inert core of helium. And that shell is going to move out. And as it moves out, it's changing the, uh, the, uh, the hydro uh, hydrostatic forces or hydrostatic um, equilibrium again. And so we're going to puff out. So the, all those explanations of the sun's going to puff out into the Earth's orbit, it's because we've run out of hydrogen right in the middle and we're starting to burn hydrogen further away from the centre of the sun. It puffs out really far. And then 
let's go to a point where um, it's going to get hot enough in the middle for, um, for helium to start fusing um, into uh, larger elements. And so we're going to then come down um, effectively, uh, the core is uh, going to contract and the star will contract, it will get brighter. We've got a couple of routes we could possibly take as we go through, but essentially it's the inside which is changing inside the star. So this is what um, we're like when we come off the main sequence. So uh, we'll have inert helium in the middle by doing nothing, hydrogen fusing on the outside, then we'll get to uh, helium fusing, and then we'll actually have carbon in the middle of our star, and that's going to throttle our star. We're never going to get enough temperature in our star to do anything with that carbon that's in the middle. So that's it, the end. But we've puffed up really nicely, and we've just gobbled up, in puffing up, we've gobbled up uh, Mercury, we've gobbled up Venus, and we've probably nibbled at the edges of Earth, if not eaten at Earth as well. So Earth is gone now. We're about 10 billion years on. So we've got about 5 billion years left, so don't worry too much. And uh, we're then going to lose those outer layers. They're going to puff away, and we'll be just left with the core, which is essentially a hot carbon core in there, which is our white dwarf. But it's not generating energy. It's just got so hot over the years. And why does it so why does it appear sort of in this blue area? And that's because all the outside layers have come off. And you're just seeing the hot interior, which is kind of hidden by all the layers before. So that's why it actually moves over towards the blue. It's not that it's generating any new electricity, oh sorry, electricity, new energy. It's because it's just being revealed by the layers on the outside coming off. And just leaving this tiny planet-sized white dwarf as a remnant of what was our beautiful star. So that's the way we're going to go. But you've got five billion years, so don't worry about it. Um, there's some conjecture about whether we're going to make a beautiful planetary nebula. Um, some people say we're not. Some people, I want to, I want us to have a beautiful planetary nebula. If you ever see something, that's, the Ring Nebula, um, M57, there's a white dwarf in the middle and there's a beautiful, Photographically, green dash ready pink circle all the way around. It's like a smoke ring around it. And it's these layers that have come off. Um, the conjecture is, oh, sorry, not the conjecture. The, the argument is that for that to have happened, that would that ring would have had to have come off really fast. But this process of just slowly slapping material off is actually quite slow. So you wouldn't get a nice sharp ring like that. And so um, the people who think this won't happen to the sun think you actually need another star next to yours, which actually carves that ring out of the material that's coming off your sun. Um, so if anyone's around in five billion years, if you could prove one thing or tell them wrong, that would be absolutely smashing. But we're sort of kind of middle of the road in terms of stars go. What happens on the big guys? The big guys and girls? Well, um, they go off, um, they use up their hydrogen really, really quickly in the matter of uh, millions or tens or hundreds of millions of years, and they go in to become um, supergiants. Uh, blue supergiants, it's a red supergiants, we just get to um, be a red giant, but they become super. And it depends on how heavy your sun is. So nine solar masses, 25 solar masses, 40 solar masses, 85 solar masses, when you get really big, you go into blue, but you just don't live long enough to get in to be a super, a uh, red supergiant. And the red supergiants are the big stars. They're the stars that people say the biggest stars in the universe. Okay, they're the ones here. So the really big stars that you read about and um, hear about. So we've got V Y Canis Majoris, uh, U Y Scuti. These are all huge. They're like nearly between 1,500 and 2,000 si times the size of the sun. They're huge, and they're just here, okay, up on this end of this branch. And they will come back, and they'll go back into blue phases, and it will depend on what's happening in, in their interior, so exactly how many times they do these sort of little laps, going a little hot, and then cooling down, hot, cooling down. Um, but eventually, if you're that big, then your fate is kind of sealed. Uh, you is doomed. But what do some of these things actually look like? Well, we've got our typical, that's, that's us, that's our little sun. 
So that's um, 1.5 million kilometers uh, in uh, uh, diameter. And uh, I put it up here against what it's going to be. This is what it'll swell out to. So when it becomes a red giant, this is what our sun will be. Okay, so it will go out to about two astronomical units. So, so effectively it's there. If you can imagine that the center of the uh, solar system is there and um, it will swell out to where the Earth's orbit is. So that is what's gonna happen to us. But I mentioned some of those super red giants, the real biggies. This one here. This is uh, the VY Canis Majoris. Okay, <laughs> can you imagine how big that one is? Okay, um, and uh, was it beetle juice? It's not, it's not quite as big. It's about 50%, uh, it's about, what is it? It's, uh, two thirds of the size of uh, VY uh, Canis Majoris, but it would still be big. Uh, beetle juice would still be massive compared to um, what our sun will be. Um, but that's, that's how they're gonna end. So we have a very stable life as we stay on the main sequence, but as soon as you get off the main sequence and you're not burning hydrogen right in the middle and you start, it starts to spread out into shells and you get different things being manufactured. The bigger things are manufacturing pretty much most of the bottom half of the periodic table is being made inside here. Okay, whereas the sun is gonna get up to carbon and it's kind of gonna stop at carbon. This one is going to make all the elements up to well, most of the elements up to uh, iron. It's then going to have a bit of a problem, and it's going to have a very, very bad day. Yeah. So, what does a bad day look like with a star? Well, there's a few other stars in between. So, what are the types of stars? So, we talked about very stable stars that have a lovely life. Uh, we've talked about big stars. Any other types of stars that we might see in the night sky that people talk about? Yeah, neutron stars, that's an end point. I was thinking more of our Tony Bales of this world, flashy stars. So where do the flashy stars sit in all of this? Well, they've also come off the main sequence. The main sequence is this line here. And depending on how they come onto the main sequence, you actually get some strange areas that if your star comes off in this area, you've actually become a Cepheid variable. So that's where we find all the Cepheid variables. So if you, you finish all your hydrogen, you come out here, you get into this area uh, where you start actually the chemical reaction, not chemical, the, uh, the reactions inside um, uh, okay. your outer layers um, actually start changing your behavior. And the seafood variable um, there's, is uh, helium. Um, uh, depending on how many electrons each um, atom uh, has on helium, how ionized the helium is in the outer layers of uh, those particular stars, it's to, uh, changes how um, sort of opaque the outer side of the star is. So if at a point it's too, it's very opaque, all the heat energy is stored within it and the star swells up and it becomes less opaque. And so that energy can get out and so it shrinks back down again and its luminosity changes on the size of the star. So you've actually got a process here, depending on this change between helium, um, uh, 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 doubly ionized or singly ionized, that's what happens on a, a seafood variable. And it just goes in and out, it's the hysteresis of doing this, which actually creates that wonderful thing that was originally measured um, uh, in the Levitt law. She was actually measuring sort of changes in helium ionization in stars. She didn't know it, and she died not knowing it, um, but uh, she worked it all out. So all of the different types of variable star that you've got tend to have a little home on the um, HR diagram, so you can actually work out. So you'll actually find them in a certain area. There'll be a certain luminosity, there'll be a certain uh, temperature. So we're on to how things actually end up uh, in the end. And we start, all of them start off with protostars. So everything will be a protostar. It's just how much gas, how much hydrogen actually falls into your protostar. But, dictates where you're going to be on your journey. The more uh, gas that falls onto your protostar as it's forming, um, and it needs to happen quite quickly, um, the different types. So if not much falls on, then you'll become a brown dwarf and you'll stay a brown dwarf for trillions of years. So that's it, that's your bottom line. You're a small protostar, you're a brown dwarf, and that's the end of your life. Um, if you um, had a bit more mass and became a red dwarf, 
then you actually start fusing hydrogen and eventually you'll slough off um, layers, you will become a white dwarf, um, potentially that's one of the routes the red dwarf can do. They can actually also potentially stay stable as well. Our sun on the G strand will become a red giant, um, planetary nebula perhaps, and then a white dwarf uh, move on to that. Now, if we have white dwarfs and more material falls onto them, they can actually become a type 1a supernova, um, which is a, a very distinct brightness of supernova, and it's, it's really good as a distance measure. Um, uh, so it gives us the next step to uh, Levitt's law. More, we go into blue giants, which go into red giants. Um, and when they start producing uh, iron in the core, then we'll get a collapse and we'll get a type 2 supernova. And potentially uh, out of that, we get a neutron star. Even more mass, we get type 2 supernova, uh, supernova but um, that blue supergiant will have produced a black hole. So it's all down to how much stuff there was originally. Blue supergiants go to black hole, and then spectacular, really short life, uh, supernova. And a supernova can actually explode and leave nothing in theory. It's quite hard to spot nothing, but um, potentially if you have a, a short life, then you just effectively just go. Um, there's another way of looking at it, which some people find an easier diagram. So everything starts from a cloud. You have a pro you become a proto star, and let's say a sun-like star, you become a red giant, lovely planetary nebula, red dwarf, but all the bits left over and they can go in and make more stars. Or you can become a proto star that's pretty huge, red supergiant, big kablang, uh, black hole, neutron star, or back into the star forming nebula as well. So there's lots of different routes. How you, the routes you actually take and the different twists and turns, primarily to do with how much mass is in each of your little stars to start off with. So if you eat lots when you're a little proto star, then you're gonna become a big blue star, then go on to be a super red giant or a blue hyper giant or a red hyper giant, um, which are very bright and slightly bigger. Um, versions of uh, the super giants. Um, and if you don't eat so much, then uh, you're uh, down to uh, sun-like stars. And actually, this is the majority. This is the path, to say, going the, the small side is the way. And you could have another one, which is even smaller, which is going off and being a brown dwarf and sort of not doing anything. Brown dwarfs we can't, they're really hard to spot, but they are, we think, the most populous um, uh, stars out there, failed stars. Um, red dwarfs, uh, of the ones we can see, are the most. So it's how much you eat. The other thing is, each time you go around this circle, the very first time we start this whole process, that's all pretty much mostly hydrogen and a bit of um, helium in there. Okay, But it goes round, and we've created other materials. We've created a bit of carbon, we've created a bit of nitrogen, a bit of oxygen. So we've actually changed the composition of our cloud, and that does change how these stars go on to grow. So we can't have the same stars that the universe first had. Our stars can't get as big as the stars we think were in the very early universe, because our, it's called metall uh, metallicity. Um, by things that are bigger, elements that are bigger than helium, it's changed. Okay, so we can't have those super wow, smashing blue mega stars. They're, they're, they, they wouldn't be stable enough to survive um, because of the elements we've got now. So it's changing all the time, um, but these are the process we follow. So it's uh, metallicity and mass, that's what's going to define. And then we've got this lovely little video showing you the different sizes as we go through. So there's our sun, nice and proud compared to all the planets. But it's a bit of a small fry. So we've got Sirius A that we can see in the night sky. And Vega. So Vega is pretty much over our heads right now. So you look for a bright sky, Earth star just pretty much, and that's Vega. So it's well, about three times bigger than ours. And then we've got Arcturus. Oh, so wow. if you follow the handle of the plough down, there's a bright star yeah. following the handle of the plough, that's Arcturus. So that's a, that's a biggie. And then Rigel, which we've got in Orion as well. So these are all stars, and you can start getting a feeling of how big they are compared to our sun. 
Then Beetlejuice, which we've also got in Orion. Yeah. So if we had that in our solar system, that would be out beyond you. Is it out beyond Jupiter? No, it's just before Jupiter. That would fill our solar system up too. This would fill, fill beyond Jupiter, B Y Canis Majoris. And then we've got uh, the largest one we've kind of got guesstimates on at the moment, which is U.S. Scuti. Is that in our galaxy? Yeah. yeah. Is that observed? It's observable in the north as well. I what well, Scutum is, yeah. So I, I don't actually know um, how, how uh, sort of like what the magnitude is, what, what you could um, pick up. But uh, yeah, you only have to go a couple of, uh, down. So Betelgeuse and things, um, they're readily observable. They're absolutely massive compared to um, our sun. And say so that would occupy up to a part of the asteroid field. If I put it into our solar system, Betelgeuse would go out towards the outer edges of the asteroid field. But when you think about it, that Betelgeuse has only got about 16 times the mass of the sun. And it's all because of the internal structure and getting this hydrostatic balance. You don't need to be super massive, full of like thousands of times the mass of the sun to be big. OK, it's just getting that balance between the energy that's being produced in the middle in, around all these shells and the gravity that's pushing it in. OK, and you can have that balancing act in lots of different ways. I can balance in lots of different possible ways. And that's why we get all these different configurations of stars. OK, because what's going in? Sometimes the internal inside of the sun, uh, internal inside of the star, a star is um, uh, fully convective. So you get things like, like a radiator effect going on. There's loads of churning going on. And as it gets bigger, then only radiation can work from the core outwards, and then it becomes convective. But these processes are changing. And again, this can change the, uh, the morphology of the star, how it evolves. Um, but fundamentally, it's only got a certain amount of mass. Um, and so it's pretty much going to stay um, uh, on a certain track um, with a few possible paths, depending on, as I said, the metallicity. But you've all been stars. Thank you very much. So quick, have you, do you know about stars now? <laughs> what questions do you have? What thoughts does that provoke? Or have I just stunned you and said, oh my God. Simon, no, I have a question. Yep. Yep, go for it. Okay, so, um, yeah, thanks, that was great. I particularly like that graphic of all the Gaia stars, so yeah. into the diagram. Um, so you talked about white dwarfs, and um, what, what's the ultimate fate of a white dwarf? It just cools down. There's no energy source in it. And um, it's carbon. Uh, yes, typically, um, based on us, it would be carbon that's uh, the majority in there, but there'll be other things in, so that, that metallicity mix. So you don't remove all of the fuel. No. You get to a point where you, you're not burning anymore. Yeah. Um, so there, there, could, there could be other things in that mix in there. But without heat source, you'll just cool. cool. And theoretically, there's a, something called a black dwarf. Because we couldn't see it. So it's a cold white dwarf. That's a cold white dwarf. Okay. Yeah. And are, are any white dwarfs observable by amateurs? Um, in theory, if you've got a big enough telescope, you can see the white dwarf in the middle of uh, M57. Um, so people with some large dobs have reported seeing okay. right in the middle of it. Yeah. 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 Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, Simon, the, uh, what was the kind of like? um, the internal structure of the star, Yeah. is it, the, is it the same in all stars? No. So it depends on how big you are. So your chromospheres and whatnot will be different in different stars. Yeah, uh, how mm -hmm. thick they are. Um, so you, you may have heard of wolf red stars. They're, although they're, when you get loads of uh, big, a really big star, mm -hmm. um, it, it goes it goes up to that blue end, that top end of yeah. um, the hertzberg russell diagram. And it's shining really blue, but it's shining so hot, it starts picking off layers. It's losing loads of mass which in some ways is good because you get to see the hotter bits inside. And so that's why the wolf red stars are just, they're basically throwing all their layers off, right, but generating massive amounts of energy out there. Um, but you've got similar mass stars, which are blue uh, supergiants, which aren't doing that. Okay, and it's, it's sort of just effectively how they got there, how fast they've got there, what's inside them chemically in there, how, uh, so like, 
the rates they got there that sort of sort of twist things around. Um, and sometimes you get into uh, sort of a few loops and um, uh, effectively you can have some very large stars that don't suddenly start slapping off their material. They sort of loop back between blue and red and blue and red. Um, but they're all the time losing a little bit of mass as they do that. Um, but at a point of time, they're all different. So we've got, was it, uh, 10 billion trillion different stars. So we wanted to understand stars, and all I've told you is they're all different. But uh, thanks to some very hard work by those ladies um, at the Harvard Observatory, you can group and see how they start. By having those groups, you can see where all these sort of behaviours start grouping in that area, rather than just having this 10, uh, 10 times 10 to the 22 uh, of stars and going, oh, I can't understand it all. Yeah, um, yeah so you can compartmentalise it, yeah? I'm really, really interested by that diagram that shows the sort of cycle going going mm. back into a nebula. And then I'm wondering how, how on Earth, what on Earth happened to create something like the Orion Nebula? You know, how many stars had to go supernova to, to leave all that behind? Yeah. Is that, is that what happens that, you know, yeah, that's where that, all that material comes from. And so when you get into um, one of these large stars that goes supernova, it, its core gets too much. It's still burning. Imagine sort of like the core is maybe 10% of that star. OK, and you might get a core collapse when maybe 10, 15, 20% has actually got to that point. You get a core collapse. That remaining 80% of the star's radius is still hydrogen. And it's just blasted out. All of that material is blasted out, but it's now being polluted by heavier elements. So you've got other things going on uh, in there. And the nebula, of course, it's very tenuous, isn't it? Yeah. 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 And so you've got, so you'll, you'll have uh, existing um, interstellar medium um, uh, with these uh, GMCs, uh, these molecular clouds. You'll get one of these things exploding and its material will come across. So you see all these wonderful photos that say Rob or um, uh, Roger have taken of sort of these or sort of like the outlines of supernova and how they've exploded and moved out. Well, there's, there's going to be a GMC somewhere and that's going to hit it. And there's going to be star formation that's going to occur when those two hit each other. Yeah. Some questions on oh. as well. Ben's asked a question. Oh, yeah. Um, well done. Is it possible for amateur astronomers to do spectroscopy to determine the makeup of the star? The answer is yes. Um, there's a chap called Hugh uh, in Wells and Mendips. Uh, his actual day job is he helps uh, engineer ink for printers and the chemistry for ink for printers. And his Nighttime passion, Q Allen is his name. His nighttime passion is putting a spectroscope on the end of his ordinary eight inch um, reflecting telescope. It's an SCT. And he produces research grade spectra of stars. And he does it not just on one night, he does it on multiple nights. And uh, what he, some of the stuff he was contributing to last year. Um, uh, was a particular star which had a debris field around it, a huge a gas sort of ring around it. Not, not really an accretion disk, um, but there was another star that occasionally went through it, that accretion disk. It was, it's, it's binary partner that goes through it. Um, and he actually watched it and he measured the spectra as it was going through. Um, and he, he saw, spotted over, over the few days. It was expected. I think it's got a period of something like four. I'm making it up now, about 400 days. It's, anyway, he knew that something was expected. Um, and he, from his home scope, in his back garden, measured this little star going through the disk and the changes it was actually making to the spectra of the combined stars. So he could actually see that movement going through. Um, the other thing you can do is if you take a spectroscope and you just put it on Andromeda, OK, if you've got um, a reasonable spectroscope, you can actually find out that Andromeda is coming towards you. You can see that it's blue shifted. So you, you, uh, what you do there is you take a spectra across the middle of Andromeda, you take a, pe a spectrum of a, a near uh, uh, field star, and that's going to be your calibration. And when you calibrate the two, you'll find that Andromeda is blue shifted. It's coming towards us. Depending on how good your spectroscope is and how good your processing is, you'll get a reasonable estimate for when Andromeda is going to 
impact it. You can do the same thing. You can do the left side of Andromeda, the right side of Andromeda with spectroscopes, and you can get the rotation speed of Andromeda. And this is all within home scope territory. The problem is you need a spectroscope, and the good spectroscope starts at about 600 quid. So you've got a telescope, and then you've got 600 quid to bottom in, and that's sort of the bottom of the market. You can go up to several thousand, 10,000 or so for a very good um, research-grade spectroscope to put on the back of the telescope. There is a company in Cajun that went to this with filter yes. ratings. Yeah. So if you just went into the plane, you yeah. see a spectrum, you can put those. Those are called the star analyzers in there. I think it's a 100 and 200, depending on the grading, um, how detailed they are. Um, so we've got one from Jonathan. Uh, I've read that the sun is third generation star. Does that mean it has been made from material from old dead stars? Yep. Yeah. So uh, we are population one. This is astronomers name everything really badly. So you'd expect the very first stars to be called population one. No, we're the, the last lot of stars, the latest lot of stars, and we're population one. Oh, the sorry. originating oh, stars yeah. are population three. So Big Bang, realization events, the first stars form, they're population three. Okay, they then explode. They're, all their bits are churned round. They, they pollute the um, molecular clouds that are already there with their entrails, as it were. Um, we've got the first kilonovas occurring, so it's even gold split out. So that gives us population two stars. Um, and then they all died, and now we're population three. So we are third generation. And um, so a lot of the stuff, everything around us is part of that third generation. However, I know that um, Prim loves her meteorites. You can get meteorites that have got pre-solar grains in them. They're effectively second generation. The um, population two, the material that came out of the population two stars is in those meteorites. Uh, it's only a certain few types of meteorite have got them. These they're called solar grains. Um, oh, sorry, they're called pre-solar grains. Um, so if you get a, a meteorite with pre-solar grains, they're from population two stars produce those, not the latest generation of stars. You wouldn't admire stars now, aren't you? <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> so now when you look up, especially when you look at Orion, can you remember Rigel was like six times bigger than our sun? It was huge, right? And then we went on to Betelgeuse, which made Rigel look tiny. Okay. So just when you admire Orion in the night sky, just think about those massive stars up there. Now, uh, Betelgeuse is a red supergiant, and so it's going to go bang one day. Um, <laughs> we don't know when. Maybe um, not. But part of your question of uh, sort of like how different are they and uh, sort of like the inside things, the reason why we lost Betelgeuse or dimmed so significantly twice a few years ago is because it was producing carbon right in its centre. And I talked about convection versus radiation. Now, um, Betelgeuse is in a, uh, a convective. So, so some of that the carbon from the centre was convected up. So if it was purely radiative, that's just energy photons trying to get out, right? But if you've got convective, you've actually got mixing going on. And it brought carbon to the surface of um, Betelgeuse. And that's what was sloughed off as a layer. That convective layer brought up all that carbon. And that's what came off. And so we saw Betelgeuse bright in the sky and then just suddenly dimmed by uh, two or three times. And like we were all going, it's going to explode. And then it brightened up a bit. And that's because that carbon then sort of diffused as it moved away from the star. And we were just looking through sort of a, a more and more diffuse layer of carbon until it was back to its original uh, brightness. And then it did it again. And we were convinced it was going to explode again. And it didn't. So you should, if it, if it dims again, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, it's cried wolf twice now, so um, uh, I'm, I'm going to ignore it from now on. Um, but it's still very beautiful um, uh, to watch. And... Beetlejuice oh, is, uh, gone. Yeah. Red, isn't it? Hmm? is red to look at, isn't it? Uh, Beetlejuice is red, yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and it's massive. So um, the luminosity thing's a bit of an odd one, because you talked about size. It's effectively... The bigger you are, the more surface area you have, the more luminous you are. Right. Um, so it's 
um, effectively, there is so, only so much energy that's trying to get out, but the bigger you get, actually, um, part of the reason the bigger you get is um, the, instead of doing generating energy right in the middle in a small ball, you're actually doing it over a larger surface of a sphere, there is actually more energy that you can now burn hydrogen faster. So this is another reason why you can spend 10 billion years on the main sequence or 5 billion years on the main sequence. You suddenly become something called a subgiant and then you, you snowball and it's as you as your um the uh, the hydrogen burn moves away from the center it's actually increasing the surface area so you can get more hydrogen reacting and turning into helium so suddenly everything speeds up and that's why suddenly things when they move off you can spend billions of years on the main sequence and then only tens or hundreds of million years on these other cycles because it, all your reactions have started speeding up yeah I wasn't quite sure on that cycle how it was going back towards the main sequence sort of cycle. So effectively, um, you're off the main sequence. Yeah. So you, your remnant, so you might be a black hole, you might be uh, a neutron star, you might be a white dwarf. You're off the main sequence. You're, that's, that material's gone forever. Yeah. But the cloud that you pushed off is now ready to become another GMC, uh, um, giant molecular cloud, and new stars condense onto it, and they would fall onto new positions on the main sequence. Okay, so all the material comes off. Effectively, you're now off the um, Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. Yeah. That material will come together again, form a protostar, and you'll fall back onto. So that was that loop that you showed. Yeah, before, yeah. Around. They're different kind of diagrams. Well, I, I don't quite like the loop one because it, it's it's oversimplifies. Uh, what can be, but in, in some ways it's very useful. Um, but yeah, so eventually everything comes off the Hertzsprung Russell. It will be uh, reborn as a new star, which will then pop onto the Hertzsprung Russell diagram above the main sequence. And as it goes from proto star into main sequence mm -hmm. star, it'll drop onto that main sequence. But it could be anywhere on that main sequence. Yeah. Isn't it? So it doesn't yeah. necessarily have to be at that height. It could have been that. Yeah. That. So um, what you'll probably get is you'll get a uh, so population three star, you'll have a really dense area of cloud. Okay. And you'll have big stars. So you'll be all the way up this end of the HR diagram. Yeah. But as your material starts thinning down, you'll start getting smaller because you just can't bring that much material together. And so you'll go from the big stars to the smaller stars. Okay, there'll still be a few good places where there'll be enough material to bring in um, uh, and make a medium to um, high mass star, but you'll just be using it up. There's still actually a lot of material out there, as just looking at the Orion Nebula um, itself. And sort of, it's, it's quite diffuse. It just, when you bring it together, that's when it happens. So there's lots of material out there, but you just need those actions to bring it together. Any further reading? Gosh. <laughs> um, God, do, 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 do. Where do I? I went to the internet. <laughs> um, no, I, I, I did the, the, the well, I actually asked someone for a book on stars and it arrived at Amazon and it, not one page has been used to help this. <laughs> because it goes through that hydrostatic cycle for each of the star types and masses going through. And it's full of equations on how you balance it. It's, Eddington also came up with a limit on how bright a star can actually come up with as well. It's all the equations that he derived to do that. And it's essentially, you can only put a certain amount of energy into gas. Okay, so after you put too much energy in, that gas is just going to ionize and go. It, it, no amount of um, gravitational force is gonna hold it there. There's just too much energy, which means that you just can't put a certain amount of light. So stars can only get so big because then it got bigger and brighter, the top layer would come off. Okay, so they wouldn't be as big. Okay, so it's just a certain mass you just can't get beyond, and that's called the Eddington limit, certain luminosity you can't get beyond. So he did loads of stuff, and that's a chapter in this book. So I, I went, so I opened it, started it, and then Keep it simple. There's been lots of good stuff um, on there. Lots of um, on NASA, uh, European Space, um, uh, yeah, sorry, the European Southern Observatory's got lots of material online. So that's probably where I'd stick to, uh, unless you want to take up a degree. Um, but if you do, then I would actually uh, recommend things like a University of Central Lancashire or Open University. If you want to know more, do a degree. But during um, lockdown, yeah. Um, 
I um, was looking for stuff to do. And I, I came across the Open University free open learning courses. And, and there is one on on um, you know, star, de yeah. star development, um, which um, also included the facility whereby you could use um, these robotic telescopes on the Canary Islands to measure um, uh, um, light curves and so forth. So, you know, I found that really interesting. Yeah, and the, some of the ones here at the US, some of the courses to tease you in free. Yes, um, I'm not sure they're still doing that. This one was free. Yeah. Uh, no, there's a whole set of um, open room courses yeah. which are free. Yeah. yeah. And you might say, I, I just want to know a bit more about this particular topic. And you just pick up one of their modules and you can yeah. do one of their modules. It'll cost you a few hundred pounds, but you can do that. And it's very enjoyable. Yeah. And then some people then go, actually, I'll do another one. I'll do another one. Do another yeah. one. And after about six, seven years, they get a degree. And they've had a, a wonderful time all the way through doing it. They haven't had the freshest week or the beer, but uh, <laughs> they've had a, a pretty good time. Uh, what we got from Jonathan, do older galaxies have slower star formation? Oh, well, that, this is why we need um, uh, Dr. Beckett to talk about uh, quenching. So um, the older galaxies with uh, larger black holes, they apparently seem to have quenched star formation um, within them. They've, um, and coming up with theories about when, what's causing that quenching. Um, and also what's causing the growth. So we've got some very large black holes, but um, in older galaxies, but how did they get that? But what are the things like the spirals in the, um, the barred spiral galaxies feeding into that central region? But there's loads of material. So there's, when you do, um, so people do uh, sort of uh, multi-frequency uh, uh, images of galaxies, um, it helps if you're uh, NASA or the European Space Agency or something like that. But if you look in the blue, so we're looking for those fresh young stars, um, then you can actually see where effectively the waves, those the molecular, that we see the star interactions coming through, the waves that are going through um, galaxies, they're causing this ripple of star formation that's going through. And by looking at the right for, um, frequencies, you can see that star formation. You can see where the clouds are heating up. So um, James Webb's telescope is really good at cutting through to find out where star formation is going, where those protostars stars are kicking in to becoming proper stars on the main sequence. James Webb can look through all of the guff in around the galaxy and just find where those star formation areas are. Any other questions before we close? It's nine o'clock. And no one fell asleep. Uh, wow. <laughs> and that was the amateur speaker. What's it going to be like when we have professionals talking? Um, so thank you very much for coming along. Um, if you want to know more, just hang around. Um, if you're new and you um, are thinking about joining or have just joined, I printed out some of the old, um, or last three newsletters. Um, and also uh, sort of what our itinerary talks for the next year are, um, so you can get to know a little bit about uh, what's going on. Um, if you are new here and you haven't joined, and you say, well, I'm still not sure, then we'd like a five pounds off you, please. Um, our treasurer here is Jade. Uh, I'm not sure if she's got any change. <laughs> uh, she came prepared. Um, in theory, I've got a machine on the uh, on my phone that will actually take payment. So um, you never know that could work. Or take Jade to the pub and buy her a drink. Um, really that kind of treasurer. Um, um, that's... But if you join, you can actually it's twenty pounds to join per year, but you get that five pounds back. You, you, you would. So if, if you if you pay five pounds now and then actually join next week or join a month's time, we'll give you that five pounds back. Um, so uh, you can, you don't have to be pressurised into doing it, but uh, uh, it would be great to have you join us because what are the other benefits? Okay, you get these talks and you have the opportunity uh, to hear me waffle, but um, we also go down to the pub, you've got, uh, you, your membership card will give you access, uh, Joe will let you uh, access all areas within the museum and um, study. And it's nice but <laughs> Uh, um, <laughs> uh, you'll get loads of information on emails about what's going on. So things like, uh, did everyone know that Tim Peake had got a new program on Channel yes. Five that started not this Tuesday, Tuesday but last Tuesday? Uh, 
Yeah. Um, and don't tell me about the inaccuracies in it, because it's a new game. It's a new drinking game. Watch his program and drink when there's an inaccuracy. Yeah. Um, it's not too bad. Um, but there's also, I, didn't, I was there and I saw they've got Dara Bryan talking about um, the moon, um, which is kind of cool. Um, we've got uh, loads of things going on. So we'll, we've had two recent trips to Monks and Coombe, and we'll just keep doing those. So um, uh, effectively, there's an events list, and we'll just email out to say we're going to Monks and Coombe this Friday or whatever. There are public nights, so those go up on the board, but they're more uh, people actually leading you around and, and sort of actually, if you'd like to bring your own telescope or like to know a bit more about the telescope that's being used. That's why membership is great. Um, because you can bring your telescope along that you accidentally bought from, I don't know, Argos or whatever. Um, it's best to do this in the dark so you don't see our faces. Uh, <laughs> uh, we grimace a little bit. Um, you can get good viewing of something at pretty much any telescope. Yeah. Um, it's just, it's harder usually on the cheaper models that come from uh, the camera shops and things like Argos to actually get something that's rewarding. And the thing about seeing something rewarding is it spurs you on to look at the next thing, which spurs you on to look at the next thing. So that's one of the reasons why. But even with um, sort of uh, sort of uh, mediocre kit, you can still see one push images of the moon. You see star clusters. We just we can point you and get you used to using it. And one day you will polar align. Uh, one day, one day, one day. yeah. Um, uh, it's not the easiest thing to do. Um, and uh, you can follow the guidance that uh, Steve Warbis is going to bring to actually start doing some um, happy sort of photos. He's, he's all about quick photos. Um, there are loads of ways of doing, going about and coming up with images that are amazing and complicated that took, oh God, I don't know, Rob, 12 hours, 20 hours, 100 hours to take um, because you've taken lots of images. Uh, through the same filters and then you put them into the computer and then you get rid of all the noise and you spend three times more time on the computer than you did behind the telescope but you come up with the most amazing steve talks all about how not to do that and um, just take like a few images and um, uh, bring them together quickly and simply and have something that's rewarding quick uh, recognition reward um and for those that haven't bought a telescope if you want to become a member and for those that are members we have a loan scheme so you can actually just <laughs> Um, get your own telescope, so we'll, we'll learn your telescope. So uh, the young lady here is going to have um, one of our little telescopes. I think Caroline is the one you're after. So that's a fully automated use your phone, whiz it around. I want to look at that and it'll go off and find it for you. Okay, so we've got three of those. Now we've only got two of those um, uh, to go out and learn. But they're there to be used, so please use them. Um, we've got them, uh, so you don't even need to buy your own kit. We will eventually ask for it back, but uh, we'll have to see. Um, and we do loads of outreach as well. So um, you, you can get involved in that in different ways. And we do socials. So we had that wonderful little trip on Monday to go to Blackett Observatory and actually sort of talk to other astronomers and some of the amazing kids and actually look through something like a telescope that uh, dates back to 1860. And you can see the sort of wonderful engineering in it. But also the great optics, but also the joy of the people operating it. And we, we do a similar thing. Um, yeah, you tell us, okay, maybe. Um, but uh, we, we do loads of stuff. We go to schools, we've got the mobile planetarium. So whatever you want to get involved in, whether it just be having a few beers, talking about it, astrophotography, actually just observing, and or going out on a meteor um, observing that, we, we do it all. So, yeah. Thank you very much.